Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and today I want to talk about a very special type of UFO encounter which I call schoolyard UFO encounters. These are cases in which UFOs hover over schools, sometimes landing. I've documented about 100 cases, more than that actually, coming from all across the world. Uh, these are not normal sightings. Your typical sighting is a flyby of an anomalous light late at night. These are profoundly different in a number of ways. First of all, in these cases, they directly target schools coming from above or the horizon and heading over the school and stopping in a number of cases. These are very low-level sightings, a uh, thousand feet, a couple of hundred feet, sometimes much less. These are typically daylight sightings. Also, these are very long-lasting sightings, uh, not just a couple of minutes, sometimes hours or even days. Uh, they're very widely viewed, 30 students, 40 students, 50, 100, 200, even 400. Often teachers also view these objects in about half the cases, in fact. Uh, typically, in these large cases, there's a government response of some kind. Uh, police, perhaps, or even Air Force uh, becomes very interested in these sightings. So all kinds of schools are being targeted, but 50% of the cases involve elementary schools, uh, our youngest children. So that I find kind of interesting. At least 30 to 35 percent of these cases are not sightings. These are actually landings and sometimes humanoids are seen. So again, these are very close encounters. Uh, part one of this presentation is going to cover just the sightings because there's a lot. And uh, part two, I will cover the landing and humanoid cases. So let's just get right to it. There are a lot of cases. Uh, earliest case I could find took place in 1853 in Spencer, Tennessee, over Burritt College. Uh, it's a typical schoolyard encounter. It lasted about 20 minutes, two lights glowing, pulsating, putting on what amounts to a display for a number of students and teachers. Really, cases began in the 1950s. The earliest I could find was March 15th, 1950. It occurred to a Prestonburg Elementary School. It's a little town in Kentucky, Prestonburg. There were 35 kids and the teacher, Miss Holbrook, when three very loud UFOs, uh, not planes, came swooping down over the school, scared the daylights out of the kids. Some fainted, some threw up. They scattered, thinking it was the end of the world. And uh, these objects moved off. Finally, Miss Holbrook got the students calmed down. And about an hour later, four UFOs showed up and again buzzed the school, causing near panic. So apparently, these objects do want to be seen. There's something very strange about the timing of these cases, because it was two weeks later. About 150 students and five teachers at Pine Point Elementary School in Ponsford, Minnesota, saw a metallic mirror-like object, which stayed hovering over the school for most of the morning. Uh, a few months later, in October 1950, a teacher and the entire fifth grade class at a school in Emporium, Illinois, watched a classic UFO hovering outside the window for about 10 minutes. So these cases, you know, following 1950, seem to occur about once per year. Uh, in May 1951, at Irving Elementary School in Kansas, both the kids and the teachers saw a uh, what they described as a beautiful silver disc-shaped object which hovered over the playground at a pretty low level for the entire duration of the lunch period. Uh, finally, the kids had to go inside, and after that, the UFO went away. But it's important to note that around this time, kids, you know, particularly at that age, uh, had no conception of what a UFO was, uh, so they did not even really know what they were looking at. In 1952, at 4 p.m., school had just let out at uh, Elder Park Elementary School. This is Elder Park Primary School in Glasgow, Scotland.
Scotland. And everyone was walking out on the playground when they saw a very large shadow, circular, coming down on the field. And looking up, they saw a huge metallic sombrero-shaped craft. It moved silently and slowly and started to hover over the school itself, right over the steeple, maybe 50 feet up, and uh, stayed there, rotating. Finally, it started to make a loud whining noise. It tilted and it darted off over the city of Glasgow, where a bunch of other people saw it. Uh, another case occurred about one year later, July 1953. The student was 13 years old. His name was Donald McAlpine. He and a bunch of other students on the playground saw this metallic saucer, uh, a disc-shaped craft hovering at about treetop level right behind the large elm tree next to the playground. Uh, the investigators from NICAP, the National uh, Investigative Committee for Aerial Phenomena, um, interviewed the students, and they felt like this UFO was spying on the kids. Uh, cases all over the world, one from France, comes from French researcher Aime Michel. This is in 1954 during a wave of sightings. A UFO appeared, and it made a beeline for the school, the École Les Russes school, and a teacher and about 23 students saw this object came t towards the school, stopped right over the school, turned on its side, then resumed a horizontal position and darted off. Uh, one of my favorite cases occurred on October 22, 1954 in Marysville, Ohio, to the Jerome Elementary School. It was a beautiful day. The kids had been good, so they got an extra recess. Around 3.15 p.m., a bright disc-like object showed up in the sky. It was very low. It had very bright lights. Finally, some of the students decided to go get the teacher, and they got the principal, Mr. Warwick. Uh, he runs out and sees this thing. He said it was almost too bright to look at. He's never seen anything like it before or since, and he called for another teacher, Miss Dittmar, to come out and look at it as well. She comes running out, at which point it disappears. She didn't get to see it. But following this, uh, the entire sky filled with this weird cotton candy-like substance. We now know it as angel hair. Uh, we're not sure what it is, but it's a very fibrous, light, white-colored uh, substance that looks very much like cotton or cotton candy. And it fell over the school for the next hour or so. Uh, Ms. Dittmar said it was absolutely beautiful covered the entire playground and about a three-mile circle radius. Uh, some of the students collected this stuff up, brought it to the teachers who took it into their hands and uh, coiled it up. And it formed small gelatinous balls, which eventually just dehydrated or dissipated and disappeared. It turned the both of the teachers' hands green, however, temporarily. <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting case. They did manage to save a sample, which they sent to Lockbourne Air Force Base, but never heard back from them. Uh, what's interesting about this case is years later, researchers found out that Robert C. White, an Air Force officer who worked in a governmental capacity studying UFOs, had heard about this case. It generated special interest in his office because they were not able to solve it. Uh, in December... 1954, there was a huge display of UFOs over the town of San Lorenzo. Over a thousand people viewed this object. This is in uh, Argentina. And uh, at least 400 students s saw this display over the San Lorenzo College. Two fainted from all the excitement. And it was, yeah, very dramatic. <laughs> Uh, sighting, and that's sort of the pattern we see in these kinds of cases. It appears that they're putting on displays. Typical case occurred in 1955 uh, at an elementary school in Nashville, Tennessee. 13 year old student Stanley Mikael Heine was one of the witnesses. Uh, he, 30 other students, and their teachers saw a metallic saucer hovering about 300 feet 
away from the school. It hovered for just a few minutes and then darted away. But it had a really big effect on Stanley and he became very interested in astrophysics and would speak about UFOs on radio shows uh, throughout his life for years afterwards. Uh, another very interesting case that's almost identical to the Jerome Elementary School case occurred almost exactly one year after it on October 27, 1955. This event occurred at Whitsitt Elementary School in North Carolina and there were 120 students and the principal, his name was H.D. Lambeth, uh, they all observed and another teacher six or seven metallic sphere-like objects darting around in the sky and just like in the Jerome Elementary School case they released an enormous quantity of angel hair over the school playground. I honestly think this was deliberate, a display, sort of like a gift or a calling card uh, because angel hair cases are very rare and here we have two in a row and it fits this pattern of displays. The entire playground was covered with this angel hair. One of the students scooped the stuff up and actually put it in his mouth and began to eat it before the principal could stop him. He spit it out. He said it tasted salty and bad. Uh, again, the principal did get a sample, which he sent off to Burlington Science Labs who were not able to identify it as any known substance. They thought it was organic. Uh, they suggested sending it to a biologist because the only thing they could think it might be would be spider webs. Uh, so they did. They sent it to a biologist and the biologist immediately ruled out spider webs as the fibers were far too even and there was no evidence of spiders for that large quantity of angel hair. Uh, this was a case that did generate a lot of interest. The Air Force heard about it and sent over Captain Murray Thornton, who actually tried to debunk this case and told Lambeth what he was seeing were reflections on the clouds. Uh, what, well, it turned out that Principal Lambeth was a World War II veteran who had flown more than 40 combat missions and was actually, actually an air, aerial observer a trained observer. <laughs> so he was a very good witness and uh, he wasn't having uh, any debunking from Captain Thornton. So lots of cases. Uh, by the way, in that Whitsett, North Carolina elementary case, the sample of angel hair mysteriously disappeared at some point. In the years following, wave in 1956 and 1957, there was a huge wave of sightings, uh, too many really to cover. There was a school in Bakersfield that was visited, another in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, one in Ada, Oklahoma, another in Homestead, Pennsylvania, another in Salina, Pennsylvania. It hovered about 100 feet over the school in uh, that case. Uh, Bismarck, South Dakota had a visitation, a school in Dublin, Ireland, um, Alaska, Brazil, uh, England. Uh, there were two cases uh, from that period, 56 and 57, that really stood out. Both occurred in 1957 in New Zealand. One occurred on April 10th at Terradale School in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. At least 30 students saw a glowing cigar-shaped object just a few thousand feet above the school performing all these really fantastic maneuvers. And it was just a few months later on August 2nd, 1957, when 130 students and three teachers at Reefton District High School uh, in New Zealand saw a glowing cigar-shaped object, again a few thousand feet up, performing fantastic maneuvers before darting away. Uh, cases pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, one case comes from Xiaoping, uh, China, in the Hunan province. It was just before dawn, still dark, when a giant fiery object came over the school. It dipped down into the valley where the school was. It was huge. Uh, it was glowing bright and actually gave off a lot of heat. It made a weird sound like chirping birds, left a very strong odor. 
and uh, moved pretty slowly, made a, a, a sharp turn, and then moved off into the distance. So clearly not uh, meteor or, or anything like that. Another case occurred in Brazil at Machado Elementary School. Uh, that was June 18, 1958. A bunch of students saw this object go right by the school. One month later, at Rickman's Grammar School in Hertfordshire, England, there was a hat-shaped glowing saucer with a yellow band, which again moved right next to the school. Uh, an amusing case occurred at R Ramapo High School in New Jersey on October 29th, 1959, when a student, one of the football players, ran into the locker room and said a UFO was hovering over the playing field, and the entire football team, dressed only in their underwear, went running out onto the field and observed this object for about five or ten minutes, but had to go inside because it was too cold. So, yeah, I think these objects are definitely putting on displays on purpose. In 1959, at Fleetwood Elementary School in Canada, a UFO appeared for like six days in a row and later appeared in 1962 to a student and his mother. And at that point, they saw it was only 20 feet over the school. Uh, there are at least three cases in 1960. Uh, there was a good one in Scotland, another in Rogersville, Pennsylvania, where an object hovered about 100 feet over the school. Uh, there's one interesting case which occurred at James Logan High School in Union City, California, where only one student saw the object. It was very low. It covered most of the playground, he said. He turned around to tell the other students to look, and when he looked back, it was gone. Uh, this is not the only case like that, where only one student will see things. A great case occurred in 1961 in Washington, another in 1962, where 180 children at a school and teachers at a school in Argentina saw three UFOs buzz over the school. There was another case in China in 1963. Uh, also in 1963, there was an interesting case in Markleyville, California, where about 20 kids and teachers, this is a very small school, uh, saw this object just drop down out of the sky and it hovered right next to the school, 40 feet overhead, for just a few minutes, and then darted away over the nearby mountains. A very strange case occurred just a few days after the famous Lani Zamora landing in Socorro, New Mexico, and not far away from there at all. This is at Lowell Elementary School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, April 29, 1964, bunch of students saw this egg-shaped object hovering over the school. It was very low, making pendulum-like movements and yo-yo-like movements. One of the students, Sharon Stoll, uh, watched it their entire duration of the recess and uh, returned to her classroom where she started to feel uh, unwell. She went to the nurse, and the nurse was shocked to see that there were burns on Sharon Stoll's face. She was rushed to the hospital and was diagnosed with second-degree burns. Her eyes swelled up. She had difficulty seeing for a number of days, and it was painful. Her mother was very alarmed because over the next month or so, uh, Sharon suddenly became much more mature, not only mentally but physically, and grew almost a half foot over, in a, period of, over a period of a few weeks, uh, which the mother attributes to this sighting. Uh, that this was a case that also generated interest from a lot of UFO researchers. Uh, a very compelling case occurred on April 22, 1966, at Beverly, Massachusetts, Beverly High School. A young girl, Nancy Modugno, was in her home next to the school when she saw a UFO just float down the street. She ran downstairs, told her parents who didn't believe her at first, but she insisted that she saw it. So her mother and two other ladies exited the house and walked over to the Beverly High School next door. They were standing next to the field and were shocked to see that their daughter had been right. There were three objects. One was very low. They were metallic with colored lights. Uh, there were no apparent other witnesses, though at the time there was a, 
high school game going on inside the school. Uh, these three ladies were watching this object when one of them decided to wave at the closest one, which she did. At that point, the object swooped down right over their heads about 20 feet. Uh, two of the ladies scattered. One was rooted to the spot. The object got even lower. Uh, they s Finally, the remaining woman ran away and all three ran home. One of the women had been so frightened by the object's appearance that she urinated herself. Uh, once home, they called the police, gathered some more neighbors and uh, everyone uh, within shouting distance and a group of about a dozen people approached the school again and the objects were still there. One of the objects was now about 40 feet over the school building. When the police arrived, one of the police officers got out of his cruiser and said, okay, who called about the plane? And uh, they pointed out the object. Uh, he was visibly shaken. The other officers saw it as well. And uh, eventually this object darted away. What's really interesting is this object did not leave. It actually made a beeline for the nearby Gordon College, about f five minutes away, very close. And it swoops down over the quad there at Gordon College and scares the living daylights out of another group of students. So I mean, clearly these objects are targeting schools. Raymond Fowler investigated this case. He interviewed the witnesses, the police officer, uh, and other people in the area. Uh, the Air Force expressed some interest in this case. Project Blue Book investigated it, and after really nothing more than a cursory examination, uh, said that the witnesses had mistaken the object had mis for Jupiter, and that what they were seeing was actually Jupiter. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, so there are cases where people have actually managed to photograph these things. In January of 1967, an object was repeatedly seen hovering over Hotchkiss High School. Uh, after appearing several nights in a row, uh, it was seen by many students and at least eight teachers. One of the students, 17-year-old Richard Gipstein, uh, took a photograph of it. It was a time-lapse, five-second long photograph and actually managed to capture this object that has appeared, as it appeared and disappeared. Uh, following this incident, the sighting suddenly stopped and uh, that was it. The UFOs moved off to another school to target, uh, which they did just a few months later, March 9th, 1967. About 40 students and three teachers, nuns, and a guard, a uh, police officer, William Fisher, were at the Sacred Heart Elementary School in Moline, Illinois, when this very large object glowing, appeared over the school and started putting on maneuvers. People around the school saw it as well. It stopped traffic. William Fisher happened to have a movie camera as part of his job. He ran and got it and managed to take about 30 seconds of film of this object as it moved off into the distance. Uh, he told the police. Uh, the Air Force expressed interest in his case and did an interview. And he was later approached by men in black type characters who, from some intelligence agency that they would not divulge who also expressed interest in his case and in particular the footage. So many, many cases. Uh, two other cases I know of in 1967, a principal and teachers and students at a school in Shimokin, Pennsylvania observed three objects hover over their school for about 90 minutes, uh, one of which was very low. And uh, what was interesting is at the time, there was a power outage in the area. Also in 1967, students at a school in Venice, California, were buzzed by a very loud UFO, which made kind of an electronic siren-like noise, apparently to get their attention, which it sure did. Uh, many of these cases involve strange memory problems. A good example is what happened uh, in 1967 at Spring Creek Elementary School in Dallas, Texas. One of the students recalls uh, about 100 students, himself and teachers, saw a very large UFO come 
swooping down, it hovered over the school, it released a bunch of silver disc-like objects, causing a, a complete panic. Um, everyone rushed back into the school. Uh, he forgot about it until some time later and started asking all the students and teachers who were there, and nobody remembered. He finally found one other student who did remember, though his version of events were slightly different. He remembered it taking place at his house, and he said that they were the d little discs weren't silver, they were red. So yeah, weird memory problems, which makes me think probably a lot of these cases are taking place and aren't being reported at all. A great case occurred a year later on May 21st, 1968. English teacher Karma Winterton and 21 students at the Union High School in Roosevelt, Utah, saw this object hovering right next to the school uh, for at least 15 minutes. It was very low, hovering over a small hill next to the school. Uh, this case was investigated by Frank Salisbury and Junior Hicks. Uh, and this took place in a very active area, the Wintaw Basin in Utah, which, by the way, is not far from the Skinwalker Ranch, which is very famous. Uh, not all of these cases are seen by students. Some involve just teachers, actually. In 1969, uh, five teachers and school administrators, their attention was drawn outside by a large silver object hovering over the school for just a few minutes. Another more dramatic case took place in May 1970. Uh, this is in Bronx, New York, at Public Elementary School number 54. Uh, at least 100 students saw this. It was a very large, silver, pyramid-shaped object the size of a school bus. It was only 100 feet high, and it was spinning pretty much the entire duration of the recess. Uh, the student who reported this had to go inside, but when he went inside, it was still there. Uh, a very impressive case uh, took place uh, also in 1970 in Maranui, New Zealand. Uh, about 400 students and two teachers saw this. One of the teachers first noticed something was strange when the normal hustle and bustle and loud noises from the children playing completely stopped, it was utterly silent. He looked around, all the students were staring up at this object which was now approaching the school. It was extremely large, covered about one-third of the sky, was black, had a glistening, almost metallic-looking surface, and stopped directly over the school. Uh, it was very silent. It stayed there for about five, ten minutes, maybe a little longer. Uh, Everyone just stared at it open-mouthed. One of the teachers, one of the students approached the teacher and asked, is that a flying saucer? And the teacher had to say yes, because he couldn't imagine what else it would was. There was an airport nearby which later denied seeing anything. At any rate, this object hovered for just a few minutes, minutes moved over to the side, changed shape, turned on its side, and darted very quickly upwards. It's an amazing case and probably one of the most widely viewed schoolyard encounters. Another widely viewed encounter took place in Foxcroft Boarding School, uh, South Carolina, October 1970. About 50 female students were out on the front lawn and observed this disc approaching very slowly, very leisurely, very low, treetop level. As soon as it got o right overhead, an uh, opening appeared in the bottom of the craft, and a bright beam of light came down and shined on the field. All the students jumped up and like, it's a UFO, take us with you, they shouted, as this object moved off just a few miles per hour and sort of led them out towards the field for a little ways and then darted off very quickly like a bullet and was gone. Uh, these encounters have a very strong effect on the students for years to come. A good example is what happened to Malcolm Robinson in 1970. Uh, he was with other fellow students at Bankery Elementary School when a white egg-shaped object appeared 
just a few hundred feet high, maybe 600 feet, and uh, was just hovering there in place. They thought it might be a balloon, but uh, Malcolm was pretty sure it wasn't. It was absolutely beautiful when suddenly this thing just disappeared or darted away. And Malcolm Robinson, later as an adult, uh, would become one of Scotland's leading UFO researchers and writers. So yeah, if these ETs are trying to convince children that UFOs are real, uh, it's a pretty effective strategy. Another case occurred in 1973 at Normandy Avenue Elementary School when students saw three gray disc-like objects hovering over the school uh, which were chased away when a police helicopter approached. In 1973, at Our Lady of Mercy Elementary School in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, Patrick Casey alerted all the other students to a metallic object that was hovering about 150 feet over the school. All the children saw this. Um, they felt a weird effect. They felt like giddy and tired uh, after seeing this object. Uh, none of the teachers saw it. They tried to alert the teachers, but the teachers did not believe them. Not the first time this happens in cases like these. 1973, a prominent researcher, Jim Book, from New York, uh, researched a case which took place at Johnstown Elementary School where 70 kids saw an object with metallic portholes with landing legs come in for a near landing. It looked like it was about to actually land uh, when it disappeared in a huge explosion of light. Uh, in 1974, there was another case where uh, at the Kulahi University where all the girls in the girls' dorm heard a loud explosion, came running outside and saw this large star-like object which started emitting s smaller orbs, five of them in total, which darted around for a few minutes and then all the orbs darted off in different directions and disappeared. In March 1975, one year later, about 60 children and teachers at Andrew Liu Primary School at Fort Victoria, Zimbabwe, saw this large metallic cylindrical object hovering at pretty low level over the school, only a few hundred feet up. It stayed there for at least three hours before finally moving away, and none of them could figure out what this thing was. Uh, in 1977, at a boys' boarding school in Eastbourne, England, two UFOs approached the school. All the students saw it from the windows before these objects just came right up to the school and then darted away very quickly. Uh, a very similar case occurred in January of 1977 in Warminster, England, when a small group of students and their teacher, Michael Greet, saw an object which they described as sort of black in color and donut shaped, circling around over the school for just a few minutes and then moving away. Uh, the headmaster, Michael Greet, uh, his description matches with the children. And he says, honestly, he was glad the children were there because he had trouble believing his own eyes. A very famous case occurred on February 14, 1977 at Rosie Ball Elementary School in North Wales. This was a case that did generate a lot of interest when a, a small group of children and their teacher observed a silver cigar-shaped object with a black dome on top. It hovered in place. It moved quickly at times. It was very low and uh, stayed for about five or 10 minutes really impressing them and then finally moved off. Uh, so yes, I mean, there's so many cases. Another occurred on May 2nd, 1977. This is less than a month later uh, in California, Downey Elementary School. A group of elementary age kids were on the playground when a very beautiful silver sphere with beautiful colored lights around its perimeter appeared at very low level. Uh, the students were all in trance. They thought it was the most amazing thing. 
and uh, it stayed the entire duration of the recess and disappeared when recess was over. No teacher saw it, but all the students were talking about it for quite some time. Uh, May 15th, just what, two weeks later, in 1977, uh, two students saw a silver disc hovering over oak trees by a parking lot. Uh, one forgot about it for years, but the other later remembered. This was on the East Coast. Uh, July 1977, Don Worley reports on the case of three boys at Maplewood Elementary School in Connersville, Indiana, who described seeing a triangular-shaped object. Uh, came over right over one of the students. Uh, he estimates it was about 300 feet across and 100 feet high. It was so large, uh, it scared, scared him, and he fell on his back as it moved overhead. Uh, on October 4th, 1977, same year again, uh, 10 children at Upton Primary School in Wales saw a UFO hovering over a grove of trees next to the school. No teachers saw it. So when all the students reported this object, one of the teachers had them separated and had them draw what they saw. And many of the drawings were almost identical, showing this object hovering among the trees and sending down this little ladder-like device. Uh, another case that which was investigated by Wendell Stevens, a very well-known investigator, uh, occurred at Florence Elementary School in Florence, Arizona when the teacher was taking all the students into the school after recess. One of them pointed into the sky and said, what's that? Uh, and it was this silver disc hovering very low. It was hovering in place and then started darting around and doing weird maneuvers. Uh, there was an airport nearby who Wendell Stevens contacted. They denied seeing anything, and uh, this object just darted around for a few minutes, uh, totally, totally silent, and then moved off. Uh, so this is what they're doing, 1978. Another object hovers right over St. Mark's Primary School. Uh, this is in England. It was shaped like a fedora, metallic, hovered about 20 feet over the ground. March 1979 at the North Carolina School for the Deaf. A uh, UFO came right over the school. It was so low, the teachers who first saw it thought it was going to hit the school. And what's interesting about this case is this UFO was emitting a very loud kind of woo-woo-woo so sound and a vibration. It was so loud that even the students who were profoundly deaf came running out to see what was causing this vibration. So everyone at the school saw it, and you could say even heard it. Uh, so I think that's another obvious display. October 1982, Adams Middle School, Grand Prairie, Texas. The school holds a sock hop. After the sock hop, a bunch of UFOs show up. They're multicolored. They put on a fantastic display over the school. Blue lights, red lights, yellow lights, orange lights, darting around for a good period of time. Uh, the next day, the, one of the students actually worked in the school office. She was surprised to see the Air Force show up. That had never happened before. And uh, the principal made it an announcement shortly later saying that what the students saw was nothing but a light show. Uh, one of the students who later became an intelligence officer did an investigation and could find no evidence of anyone who could put on a light show of that magnitude. Uh, she's pretty darn convinced it was a UFO because while these objects were overhead, everyone could feel this really weird staticky feeling, uh, which you know made their clothes act strangely and their hair stand up. So yeah, it's another great case. Another case involving weird memory problems occurred in November 1989 during a wave of sightings over France and Belgium. Uh, one lady was at a boarding school in Vendum, France, and this huge triangular object came very low, right over the school. Everybody saw it, it moved off, and nobody talked about it, including herself. And in fact, she forgot about it. Apparently everybody forgot about it, 
It wasn't until years later when her husband brought up the subject of UFOs that she suddenly remembered seeing this thing. So these cases go right up to modern times. May 6, 2002, students at a Christian school in Iron Mountain saw an object hovering at treetop level over the school. It was so low, uh, the whole class saw this hovering over the playground. It was so low that one of the students could see that this object appeared to be made out of steel rivet, steel plates, which were riveted together. Another modern case took place on September 15th, 2009. Uh, this is at Clayton High School in North Carolina. A group of students were doing band practice when a UFO appeared and started doing this display. They all saw it. It was very strange. They could not identify it. What was really strange is a couple of days later, one of the students reported uh, seeing a UFO hovering directly over her home. Uh, October 8th, 2015. Another UFO is seen hovering over Rockville High School. Uh, case after case. April 2nd, 2018. A very bright object was seen over West Nasa School. Uh, this occurred in, on Tengara Island in Indonesia. It was very bright. One of the teacher, the, all the students were panicking. One of the teachers saw this object. She quickly grabbed her cell phone and attempted to take a photo. Unfortunately, the object was so bright that all she got was just a white screen. Uh, but the point is, there are a lot of these objects. They are appearing at very low levels. They've been appearing regularly for like 50 years. And as amazing as all of these cases sound, this is really just the beginning. These are just the sightings. I haven't even gotten to the landings and humanoids. I've covered all these cases in detail in my book, Schoolyard UFO Encounters. And uh, we'll be covering the landings and humanoids in part two of this presentation. But that's it for now. Thanks for listening and keep having fun.